You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is February 5th, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, xanthines, PDE inhibitors, and chromons. Our presenter is Dr. Sean Stout. He's an allergy immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Good morning, everyone. This is the second hour of COLA for February 5th, uh, 2021. Uh, For our second hour, we're going to have a talk on um, part of our drug series on xanthines, PDE inhibitors, and chromones, uh, presented by Dr. Sean Stout, one of our first-year fellows, and I'll let Dr. Stout take it away. All right, and you guys can see my slides and hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Um, I'll be giving the pharmacology series lecture in today that's going to be based off of Middleton's chapter 94, which discusses xanthines, phosphodiesters inhibitors, and chromones. And maybe it's just my inexperience as a first-year fellow, but when I saw that this was my topic, I asked myself, what are those drugs? I've never heard of those. Do we ever use them? Um, And that's probably because they're not very commonly used uh, anymore, with the exception of some chromones in certain conditions that we'll talk about. Um, But they are still used, uh, some of the xanthines and PDE inhibitors, as add-on therapy in asthma and COPD. Um, So I think it's still important to know about them, how they work, and... I also assume that questions about these drugs are uh, fair game on our board exam. Um, And as you guys also know, Middleton's can be a little dense, um, a lot of kind of random facts strung together and um, seems can be a little bit disorganized. I did my best to try to put this all into a a good format and talk about the most salient, um, important points that I thought were, um, would be helpful for us in our practice and also in preparation for our board exam. So hopefully I I, uh, can be helpful for you guys today. So first we're going to start talking about the xanthines, and I wanted to include a little bit of history that was given in Middleton's because I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, So in 1886, a man named Henry Hyde Salter described the efficacious use of strong coffee as a treatment for asthma. And it turns out that that's because the methyl xanthine caffeine uh, does have a bronchodilator effect. And as you can see uh, here at the bottom, caffeine has a similar structure to the xanthine theophylline, which is the most common xanthine and perhaps one of the only ones you'd ever potentially prescribe. Uh, Theophylline was first administered as a treatment for asthma in 1937, so it's a very old, very old drug. As I mentioned earlier, um, I think theophylline is probably the most common xanthine, and it's probably the main one that you really need to know. And we may not have a lot of experience prescribing it because it's really fallen out of favor recently uh, with the development of new medications such as inhaled corticosteroids. And then it also has a very narrow therapeutic window of only 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter in uh, blood plasma. So whenever it is used, a slow-release formulation um, is best to overcome its rapid metabolism and maintain constant plasma levels. And it's thought to have two main benefits. First, bronchodilation, and then also it does have some anti-inflammatory effects. Actually, at the lower lower doses, it's mostly anti-inflammatory. So how exactly does theophylline work? And while there's uh, several different pathways and mechanisms that we think theophylline follows, the real answer is nobody really knows for sure. Uh, we know that it, uh, it is an adenosine receptor antagonist, um, but it's thought that this is an unlikely mechanism by which we see its bronchodilation and anti-inflammatory effects, as evidenced by the fact that there's another xanthine called doxophylline that appears to lack any adenosine receptor antagonism but still does have clinical effectiveness. Um, another possibility is that it works through PDE inhibition, and phosphodiesterases are enzymes that Uh, metabolize cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, controlling their intracellular levels. And this possible mechanism of action is supported by the fact that uh, PDE3 is present in airway and vascular smooth muscle, and its inhibition leads to smooth muscle relaxation. And this was seen in a study where cyclic AMP uh, PDE activity was decreased by about 40% by theophylline, 
which then cause bronchial tissue relaxation about 60% below baseline. Uh, additionally, PDE4 is found in most inflammatory cells involved in asthma and COPD, and we'll talk about a selective PDE4 inhibitor here shortly that's called roflumilast, and it's currently approved only for the treatment of COPD exacerbations and has been proven to be effective in the treatment of asthma, but is not uh, approved for that indication. A third possible mechanism of action is the phosphorus inositide 3 kinase pathway. Um, and I think this is one of the pathways that Dr. Rajay talked about this just on Monday in her, her uh, lecture going through all the different cellular pathways, signaling pathways. So PI3 kinase is a lipid kinase enzyme that leads to a cascade of intracellular events involved in metabolism, cell survival, migration, growth, and proliferation. And it has, uh, theophylline has been shown to inhibit its activity but it's unclear whether this inhibition contributes to any of the drug's beneficial effects. Now, a fourth possible mechanism of action involves histone deacetylases, and you may have to rack your brain back to your undergraduate molecular biology class like I did to remember kind of what histones are. And there's a, a picture here that I, that I found that is kind of helpful. Um, so histones are proteins that pack and order DNA into structural units called nucleosomes, um, which then enables compaction of our large genome into, into chromosomes. So when histone is acetylated, this leads to neutralization of the positive charge, which then leads to chromatin remodeling and unwinding of DNA, and that produces a more favorable environment for transcription factors to bind in order to regulate gene transcription. Uh, theophylline and also another xanthine that's called improphylin both increase activity of histone deacetylases, which deacetylate lysine residues and chromatin, not allowing it to unwind and effectively silencing gene transcription. Um, and an interesting fact that Middleton's talks about is that it's proposed that theophylline might inhibit uh, the activity of a kinase that phosphorylates histone deacetylase that is able to restore glucocorticosteroid sensitivity. And this is evidenced by studies that have shown that when administered with dexamethasone, theophylline leads to a suppression of IL-8 release. And interestingly, when theophylline is removed from patients that are taking both theophylline and steroids, it actually led to a deterioration in asthma symptoms. So again, highlighting the possibility that uh, theophylline is able to restore or maintain glucocorticosteroid sensitivity in patients that are taking both. And here are all the uh, proposed mechanisms that we just discussed summed up graphically in a picture from Middleton's. You can see uh, all the different um, pathways. So it, it blocks uh, the adenosine receptors. It can block the phosphodiesterase or inhibit phosphodiesterases, blocks the PI3 kinase pathway, and then also here in the green, the, uh, acting in the nucleus via the histone deacetylase uh, pathway to silence gene expression. I also wanted to include this chart from the textbook, which highlights all the specific effects uh, theophylline and uh, PDE4 inhibitors have on the immune and other cells involved in asthma. And I, we won't go through all these individually, uh, but you can see that it affects most of our immune cells and also vascular endothelium and fibroblasts. And it leads to reduced survival of some of these cells, inhibition of mediator release and release of cytokines, inhibition of cell migration, and, and so on. So uh, if you are going to use theophylline, uh, you want to start at a dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram with a max dose, a starting dose of 300 milligrams. And then you really have to monitor plasma levels and titrate the dose accordingly. Um, remember that it has a very narrow therapeutic window between 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter. So if you start the medication at the starting dose and then your first level is less than 10, you want to increase the dose by 25%. Um, if your level is between 10 to 15, you maintain the dose that you're at. Um, but once you get to 15 and above, that's when you really start to worry about potential side effects. And so you'd want to decrease the dose by 10% once you get above 15 on, on your plasma level. Now, unfortunately, once you get above that narrow therapeutic window, um, there are a lot of potential side effects. So above a plasma level of 20 micrograms per mil, you start to see mild effects of nausea, 
vomiting, diarrhea, insomnia, irritability, and headache. And above 30, uh, then it starts to lead to cardiac arrhythmias, hypotension, hypokalemia, and hyperglycemia. And above 40, it leads to seizures, brain damage, and death. So kind of a fine fine line that you're walking with uh, keeping the drug in a therapeutic window and then potentially leading to some pretty serious side effects and even death. Um, it's also important to note that while it hasn't been found to be teratogenic, um, theophylline does have decreased clearance in pregnancy, so levels really need to be monitored closely in pregnant women. And as you can imagine, uh, the significant possibility of side effects and significant drug-drug interactions and the requirement for plasma level monitoring has really limited its use. But it can be argued that its anti-inflammatory effects at low doses and its ease of administration of uh, being an oral drug justify its continued use. And it is actually still recommended by the GINA asthma guidelines and also the gold COPD guidelines as add-on therapy. This is also a table uh, from Middleton's that shows all the potential for drug-drug interactions. And again, we're not going to go through it in a lot of detail. Um, but it does highlight the care that you need to take when prescribing theophylline. Since several of these drugs are commonly found on uh, patients' med lists, at least adult patients' med lists, such as antidepressants, seizure medications, oral contraceptives, benzos, uh, steroids, diuretics, and then even alcohol and tobacco also. So just uh, like its mechanism of action is a little unclear, some of the data regarding theophylline can also be mixed. Um, Randomized controlled trials in asthma and COPD overall have shown um, that it has modical clinical effective, or modest clinical effectiveness, and showing that it can improve lung function and decrease exacerbations in patients with mild to moderate asthma that are taking inhaled steroids or patients with asthma that is poorly controlled with steroids. And other studies have shown that it may be less effective than inhaled steroid in decreasing symptoms and uh, the need for rescue medication in children with mild to moderate persistent asthma. There was a uh, Cochrane review done also that showed that it is as, at least as effective as lava in the control of nocturnal asthma in adolescents and adults with persistent asthma. And then uh, long-term treatment with theophylline and COPD has been shown to lead to improved lung function and decreased exacerbations. But there have not really been any studies looking at the overall annual decline in lung function, uh, mortality, or patient quality of life. Um, so, um, before I, actually, I think I skipped a whole bunch of slides here. One second. Let me, my computer is frozen. One second. Okay. I'm not sure why it's not advancing for me. One second. Okay. Um, so I do want to take a couple minutes and talk about some selective PDE uh, inhibitors. We know that theophylline inhibits phosphodiesterases, but it's non-selective, and that leads to um, a lot of the side effects that we see. So of particular interest are selective uh, PDE4 inhibitors. Since, as we mentioned earlier, PDE4 is expressed in most inflammatory cells and also structural cells within the lung, and they have been implicated in the pathogenesis of asthma and COPD. Uh, they've been shown to attenuate the recruitment of inflammatory cells to the lung, decrease bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and then also decrease airway edema. And an example of this is a drug called reflumolast that we're going to talk a little bit more about here shortly. Um, and it's been shown to decrease the number of inflammatory cells in the sputum of patients with COPD. While PDE4 inhibitors do have some anti-inflammatory activity, uh, they don't exhibit any bronchodilatory activity. Um, and there is a new oral uh, PDE4 inhibitor that's called Epremolast, but it is currently only used in the treatment of psoriatic arthritis and has, has not yet been evaluated in treating respiratory disease. And then in addition to the PD-4 inhibitors, um, there are also some selective PDE-3 inhibitors. Um, PDE-3 is found predominantly in airway smooth muscle, vascular smooth muscle, 
and also the heart. And for these reasons, there's significant concern that um, there could be a lot of potential side effects of hypotension and cardiac arrhythmias. An example of a selective PD3 inhibitor is actually milrinone, which um, you may recognize as a drug that's commonly used in um, heart failure in our cardiac ICU and in adult patients with uh, CHF as well. And in clinical trials, looking at it for its use in, in uh, respiratory disease, it was shown to be correlated with an increase in deaths in patients with CHF in the treatment group. And there's some more recent data about a drug called enoximone that has been used um, at least once in a patient with status asthmaticus, and it was shown to be beneficial or even potentially life-saving. However, there are no currently, uh, currently no selective PDE3 inhibitors that are approved for the treatment of asthma or COPD. And there is some belief and evidence that drugs that are considered to be bifunctional, um, acting on both the PDE3 and 4, uh, can be synergistic, likely since we know that PDE3 inhibition leads to the bronchodilatory effects, and then PDE4 um, inhibition has the anti-inflammatory effects. And there have been a number of, of attempts to develop a bifunctional PDE3 and 4 inhibitor. However, up to this point, they've all been unsuccessful due to some pretty significant GI side effects. But there is a, um, a novel drug right now that's called RPL554 that has completed a phase two trial for COPD. So we'll see if, if anything comes of that. And um, I mentioned earlier the drug reflumolast. So the main PDE4 inhibitor that's used clinically um, is reflumolast. But as I mentioned, it's only currently approved for the treatment of COPD as add-on treatment. It is uh, metabolized by the liver, so there's a lot of potential for drug-drug interactions, as you can see here in, in this chart, and it can have pretty significant side effects that often limit its use, with the most common being nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, insomnia, and weight loss. And there's also the possibility of an increased risk of suicide, and this all stems from an analysis of pooled COPD safety data, which examined uh, 12,000 COPD patients. And of all the patients that died of those 12,000, there were three um, that were from suicide, and all three of them were taking reflumolast. So, um, you know, that's an association, but I don't think a, a true causal relationship has actually been determined. Um, it's currently only available as an oral formulation. They did try to develop an inhaled form to try to limit its systemic absorption and its side effects. However, there was only a modest beneficial effect seen, and thus it was abandoned. So the question is, why was the oral option, why does the oral option have much more clinical efficacy than the inhaled form? And the thought is that it's able to reach sites of the diseased lung that is not accessible to the inhaled route, uh, via the inhaled route. And also that the oral form has more of a systemic effect in suppressing cytokine production or inflammatory cell activity that the inhaled form does not have. Um, so though it's only approved for COPD, though, there are a, 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 clinical, a number of clinical studies that have shown its ability to improve lung function in patients with asthma as well as COPD. There we go. This is the slide that I was on earlier. So before we move on uh, to talk about the chromones, I just wanted to highlight what I found to be the most important learning points for the xanthines and the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. And these are that, uh, first, they have an unclear mechanism of action. Recall that they do act on the adenosine receptor as an antagonist. There's phosphodiesterase inhibition. They inhibit the PI3 kinase pathway and then also lead to increased activity of the histone deacetylases. And of all these mechanisms, I think the one that has the most supportive evidence uh, that we would potentially be tested on is uh, the phosphodiesterase inhibition. Um, additionally, an important point is that they can exhibit bronchodilator and or anti-inflammatory effects, um, with the anti-inflammatory effects being uh, most common with the lower doses that are kind of in the more safe range of that therapeutic window. Uh, there's a serious potential for side effects and drug-drug interactions. Theophylline in particular requires monitoring of plasma levels. And uh, these days, the xanthines and the PDE inhibitors are mostly used as add-on therapy and severe asthma and or COPD. And then finally, I just wanted to, to mention um, that there is a newer xanthine called doxophylin, which I think I mentioned earlier briefly, and there's growing evidence that it may have uh, a more improved therapeutic window, so it may be a better alternative over theophylline. 
So moving on now uh, to another drug type, the chromones. Uh, the first chromone ever used was one called Kellen, which was purified from the extract of the plant Amivisnaga. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and then newer chromones were discovered by a research group in the UK that were based on the same molecular structure as Kellen. So I have uh, the structure here of chromalin uh, to compare with Kellen. There are some similarities. And then chromalin and netochromal were discovered in the years 1965 and 1979. So also kind of older drugs. And uh, Middleton's mentioned a really interesting story about one of the researchers with the UK group who was named Roger E.C. Altunian. And he was an asthmatic himself, and he would actually induce asthma attacks in himself by inhaling antigens to which he was sensitive. And then he would measure the degree of protection against the ensuing uh, bronchial constriction provided by the pre-challenge administration of any of the new chromone compounds that he was uh, researching. And he supposedly tested more than 300 different compounds on himself over an eight-year period. So very dedicated scientist. Um, so now we're going to discuss the mechanism of action of, of the chromones, um, and there's likely three different mechanisms. I think the most commonly known um, was the only one that I had known about prior to the learning uh, about this and reading the Middleton's chapter, is that it causes mast cell stabilization. And I've always wondered how exactly it stabilizes the mast cells. And apparently they've done some electrophysiologic studies on rat mast cells that showed that uh, mast cell degranulation depends upon sustained elevation of intracellular, intracellular calcium after transient inositol triphosphate induced increase in calcium that is caused by the release of intracellular stores through the calcium ion channel. And when they incubated these um, rat mast cells with chromalin, they saw that it inhibited the calcium ion channel activation. So by stabilizing the mast cells, um, the chromones inhibit the release of histamine in a variety of different body tissues that you can see here. So like lung, tonsillar, adenoidal, and intestinal mast, cell, uh, mast cells. Not sure why they were testing tonsils and adenoids, but thought that was interesting. Um, studies have also shown that it is able to decrease the amount of TNF-alpha and IL-5 released from sensitized lung specimens that were challenged with dust mite antigen. And it also reduces the increase in neutrophils, myeloperoxidase, myeloperoxidase ICAM-1 expression, and IL-6 release in bronchoalveolar lavage fluid after dust inhalation. And then finally, it also protects against inflammatory changes caused by atmospheric pollution. Um, the second mechanism of action that involves uh, it involves its effects on sensory nerves. So chromalin has been shown to inhibit substance P-induced microvascular leakage in rat trachea, and it also decreases edema in both rat and human skin. Uh, it inhibits bronchoconstriction induced by irritants such as sulfur dioxide and bradykinin, and that's likely from inhibition of neural reflex mechanisms. And then finally, the third proposed mechanism of action, which I had never heard of before and thought was, was really interesting, is that uh, it's been shown to actually inhibit the production of IgE and its release from B cells. And exactly how it does this is, is not really fully understood. So both chromalin and netochromal are not actually metabolized at all in the body. They're excreted completely unchanged in bile and urine. And chromalin, at least, uh, has a very quick half-life of only 13.5 minutes when it's given IV and then 91 minutes when it's given via inhalation. And because of these reasons, the chromones have a very low risk of toxicity and are usually well tolerated with only mild side effects. And this table uh, looks at all the side effects of inhaled chromalin, with uh, transient cough being the most common, happening in... Uh, one in five patients, then mild wheezing. Uh, rarely some of these other complications can happen, such as laryngeal edema, angioedema, bronchospasm, and, and so on. And then it's uncertain whether some of these other conditions listed here at the bottom of the of the table are actually attributable, attributable to chrom chromalin or if they were just seen in some of the patients that they were examining. And then here are some of the side effects seen with intranasal uh, formulation of chromalin. And not surprisingly, most of them are related to the nose. So most commonly sneezing, uh, nasal stinging, burning, irritation.
Side effects of oral uh, chromalin include headache, diarrhea, pruritus, nausea, myalgia, abdominal pain, and so on. And I didn't include the side effects for the ophthalmic preparations, but as you can imagine, they were mostly related to the eye. So transient ocular stinging, conjunctival injection, uh, watery eyes, and dryness were the most common. So what do we use chromones for? Um, in the past, they were used more commonly in asthma than they are now. And there used to be a chromalin inhaler called the spinhaler. I think Dr. Dowling has talked, at least to, has talked to me about this. And this, I believe, is a picture of the, the old spinhaler. Um, but it's no longer available. Um, and then dry powder inhalers are available, but only in Scandinavia and Japan, apparently. And in the U.S., there's only meter-dosed aerosols that are still available. Um, studies have shown that chromalin, inhaled chromalin did lead to significant improvement in peak expiratory flow in atopic, but not non-atopic individuals. And uh, both, both chromalin and nitochromal have been found to be significantly better than placebo. And any differences between the two were small and not found to be clinically significant. Um, so other than inhaled chromalin in asthma, there are some other uses as well. Um, such as allergic eye disease, uh, both chromalin and nitochromal can be used. Nitochromal has been found to be uh, more effective than chromalin in vernal uh, keratoconjunctivitis. And interestingly, um, I had never heard of this before, but it's also been used in food allergy, though this is not an FDA-approved use. Uh, when given in single doses of 100 to 800 milligrams, 15 to 30 minutes before ingestion of the food that the individual is allergic to, it's been shown to either prevent or reduce the severity of symptoms. So obviously this is not recommended to prevent anaphylaxis. And honestly, I'm not really sure how this would ever be clinically relevant. I think this was kind of more um, done on a research basis. And then um, chromalin is also commonly used in systemic mastocytosis and is particularly helpful in patients with GI symptoms. And this made me think about the consult that we had last month or so, uh, the girl who was having all the um, GI pain, not being able to tolerate foods, and had the biopsies that showed all the mast cells in her GI tract um, that ultimately did not meet the diagnosis for systemic mastocytosis. Um, and I think that goes along really well with this. Um, and also what Dr. Castells had responded back to Dr. Pandy about saying that, you know, this isn't really consistent with mastocytosis uh, because if her abdominal pain was from mastocytosis, she should see a significant benefit from the chromalin that she's on. And the girl that, that we were consulted on did not have any improvement in her symptoms with the, with the chromalin. Um, and then finally, it can also be used in atopic dermatitis, but again, this is not an FDA-approved uh, use. So studies have shown that uh, if you make a 4%, 4 cutaneous emulsion, that did lead to reduced severity of itch and flare induced by intradermal histamine in atopic subjects. So we're getting close to the end here. Um, I wanted to include this this table that's at the very beginning of the chapter of Middleton's that kind of highlights all the important concepts. Um, a lot of these I thought were kind of similar important concepts that I felt um, were important to go over. And then there's some others that I thought were kind of interesting that they thought was important to include in this chart. But um, so first, oral theophylline is considered a third-line therapy now for respiratory disease because of its narrow therapeutic window and it's um, the possibility for having drug-drug interactions. But there's other xanthines such as doxophylline, which uh, may have a better tolerability. And then lower than conventional doses of theophylline um, can have more anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory actions relevant to the treatment of respiratory disease. And um, at those lower doses, they may be safer with less side effects. The molecular mechanisms of action of theophylline, as I, we mentioned, are not very well understood, but targets may include um, inhibition of phosphodiesterase, inhibition of the PI3 kinase pathway, and then also increased activity of certain histone deacetylases. Uh, we talked about several selective PD inhibitors that have been identified in an attempt to improve the therapeutic window of theophylline, but really the only one that is relevant that's able to be used right now is the PDE4 inhibitor, reflumolast, and it is currently only registered as a medicine to treat uh, severe exacerbations in patients with severe COPD. Um, and its use is limited by a lot of significant GI side effects and some unexplained weight loss. 
there are a number of other PDE inhibitors that are under investigation um, and some bifunctional um, PDE inhibitors that target um, both like three and four and four and seven, but those are still under investigation. Um, this was one that I thought was interesting. They thought was an important point, but uh, chromones, chromone sodium and netochromal sodium were developed from the naturally occurring chromone kelin and an extract from the plant Amivis naga. So I'm not sure if that could potentially be something that we could be tested on. Um, and then the primary mode of action of the chromones is uh, stabilization of mast cells, and they also in, um, modulate sensory nerve activity. Um, also, it, in the um, digital format of Middleton's, there are little assessments with multiple choice questions for each chapter. And so I included the few that were included for um, chapter 94. So we'll go ahead and do these today. I think there's only three or four. Um, so I'll read the question, and then anyone that feels like they know the answer, just go ahead and jump in. So the first question, which inflammatory cells are affected by chromones? A, neutrophils. B, eosinophils, C, mast cells, D, lymphocytes, and E, epithelial cells. Hopefully this one's easy. Mast cells. Mast cells, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next, which target can xanthines inhibit? A, phosphodiesterase 3, B, neurokinin 1 receptors, C, histone deacetylases, D, corticosteroid receptors, and E, the beta-2 receptor. And this can be a little bit tricky. In fact, the actual question in Middleton's said, which target can xanthines influence? And I did not like that word because I felt like then there was two answers. So I switched to, to specifically say, which target can xanthines inhibit? And then there should only be one answer. Is it A? It is A, yes. Phosphodiesterase 3. Um, and then if by chance we could be asked about other possible mechanisms of action. Histone deacetylases could be an option, and also the adenosine receptor antagonism was the other possibility. And then I believe this might be our last question. Uh, which of the following drugs is a xanthine? A, cetirazine, B, aminophilin, C, aspirin, D, theophylline, and E, simvastatin. Any guesses? It's also kind of tricky, and we'll talk about why it's tricky here in a second. Theophylline. Theophylline, that is the correct answer. Um, so it's a little tricky because aminophilline is also an option, um, but technically aminophilline is a xanthine derivative, not a pure xanthine. Um, but it is a compound. It's actually theophylline compounded with ethylene diamine in a two-to-one ratio. And I have seen this used actually commonly um, in the treatment of status asthmaticus at, in our PICU at Children's Mercy. Um, but that's the only place I've ever seen aminophilin used. And apparently it's not technically classified as a um, xanthine. Um, so that is the last question. Um, if there's anyone that has any questions or comments, um, I did kind of want to ask those that have much more experience than I do, um, have you ever used any of these drugs? If so, what was your experience with them? Because I think um, I've used chromalin a, a handful of times, um, I think with Dr. Dowling, specifically for patients that have like pet allergy to cats as a, as a nasal spray, um, used it with on that inpatient consult for possible systemic mastocytosis for the GI pain. And then maybe, I think I've seen Theophylline maybe in one COPD patient over in uh, Dr. Salzman's clinic that was on, that, that had COPD. But other than that, I've never seen any of these other drugs used. So I wanted to see if um, anybody else has ever used them or had any experience with them that could maybe offer some insight as well. Okay, Chad, you're making me feel very old today. <laughs> That was not meant to be the case. <laughs> yeah, my, my birthday's tomorrow, which is even more a reminder how old I am. So um, um, the um, a, a number of things that I wanted to comment on. One, um, um, when Dr. Miller was a resident and was he was a fellow, um, probably was a resident, um, 
um, chromalin um, was the uh, preferred drug of choice for children who had who had um, persistent asthma because um, we weren't using inhaled steroids in those patients. Um, we were only using nebulized drugs. And the only nebulized um, uh, controller medicine that was available was um, chromalin and the nebulizer. And I thought that was the only form that was still available. I was surprised when you said that the meter dose inhaler was available because I thought that went off the market with the docker mill um, when everything switched over from, um, you know, to the HFA stuff and got rid of the freons. Yeah. Um, Middle, the, the Middleton book said that the meter-dosed aerosols were available. I haven't confirmed that, actually looking to see if they're able to be ordered or not. Yeah, and I don't know if that was in the United States or maybe, you know, elsewhere or something. Yeah, good point. Um, the, um, um, and I used to prescribe um, the eye drops that, were, and as far as I know, they're still prescription. I never heard they went over the counter, but I haven't um, done that in years, and I'm not even sure it's available anymore if they're still making it. Um, so that'd be something to look up because you said it, uh, there is some um, benefit for like vernal conjunctivitis. Mm -hmm. um, the um, um, the uh, the other thing that um, uh, chromalin um, um, the inhaler was good for was for patients. It was used as an adjuvant for exercise induced asthma. Um, mm -hmm. So if you didn't have enough, if you didn't have um, full benefit from using albuterol before exercise. Some people would add um, two puffs of, of chromalin um, via meter dose inhaler that they would do before. It also had effect on um, preventing um, um, cold-induced um, as, cold asthma symptoms. And so um, there are a number of people that would use that before, like going skiing or going out running or something like that. Um, um, and again, it could be used, um, um, you know, shortly before um, the exposure and, and help prevent symptoms. Um, um, the problem with chromalin um, with the, with the um, nebulized form was that um, it was, it, it showed some, you know, um, some benefit, um, certainly not as good as inhaled steroids, uh, but at, the t at that time, Nobody was using spacers and masks and stuff for little kids. They were, you, you would transition to that when kids were in school, basically. But before school age, everybody had to be nebulized with all their medicines, including albuterol. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see how much things have changed. And that's all changed in the last 20 years or so. Um, because back in the, um, the late 90s, um, people were still using... Um, we're still using nebulizers as, you know, your primary treatment for kids. Um, the, um, the, the thing about chromalin is you had to use it four times a day, which was a pain for most people. Um, the docromil came out, um, which was supposed to be like an improved form of chromalin. Um, the, um, it, it, the, the dosing, I think, um, as I'm trying to remember this, I think it, I think you could use it like three times a day, and if someone was stable, you might be able to get with, by with twice a day or something. Um, the the inhaler of nidocromil, um had a horrible aftertaste for a lot of people, um, and um, Dr. Portnoy and I are non-taster. Did this taste test in the clinic with samples one day with the nursing staff and the fellows, uh, but everybody else that we that tested that day gagged on the stuff because um, um, they. It, it it was it just has a um, and a lot of people that are tasters has a has a bad taste to it and one of the fellows said it tasted like road tar um, so um, so so anyways and it it didn't have much never got much of a market and again I thought with with the uh, with the changeover to um, free on free um, uh, inhalers that that kind of went by the wayside and wasn't being made anymore. Um, and I don't know about the other forms of it, um, but um, um, for the most part, the, the only things that I've seen with chromalin have been for, the, for like gastrochrome that's been used by the GI people a lot, and, um, and I use the chromalin a lot for um, um, pre-exposure to animal dander um, with the nose spray, um, which I think um, can, be, can be helpful. The other times I've seen it used... Um, 
we did try it once with, um, I got the pharmacy to compound it and, and um, when it was used to be available for the nebulizer um, and tried on a kid who had horrible eczema, um, didn't really see that much improvement. Um, but it has been used also in kids with, um, with um, mast cell disease that have, um, that have skin involvement where we've had a couple babies that have had, I thought there was one like the last year or so, that um, had, um, had um, like bullous um, um, skin lesions from mast cells. Um, uh, so mastocytoma, they had like, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like, it's like a infantile bullous something rather. Um, but, um, but basically it's, a, it's, it's mast cell disease in the skin and um, they're very young kids and they have these bullous lesions and there's, um, they have compounded it and, and used it on the skin and it's um, um, offered some improvement with that as well. So, um, but that's, you know, something that you would rarely see. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as far as um, uh, theophylline and aminophylline, I got a kick out of that too, because when I was, a, when I was a resident, everybody that came into the hospital with status asthmaticus was put on aminophylline drips. Everybody was on an aminophylline drip. We didn't use, we didn't, we didn't start using, even giving uh, oral steroids to status asthmaticus until, until I was an intern. Um, and, and that was only after they'd been in the hospital where they weren't improving with the, with the aminophylline, and then you would consider, well, maybe we'll give them a dose of steroid sort of thing. So um, you can see how much things have changed since um, um, the, the 80s. Um, <clears throat> um, and, um, so the, the one thing about um, uh, theophylline um, was that um, there used to be preparations, um, they may still have them, those um, that were like Theodore and stuff that were, that were twice a day pills that you took um, or capsules. And um, a lot of people liked those because it was just taking a pill twice a day instead of sitting for a nebulizer or whatever. Um, and we used to, that was, the, that was a first line therapy for kids as well, was oral theophylline. Um, and that was a controller medicine. And this is, again, because we weren't using um, many inhaled steroids at that time, and the inhaled steroids that they had weren't all that, uh, weren't all that effective. Um, and they were used lots and lots with people with COPD. And um, a number of years ago when I left Children's Mercy and went to Alabama, and we were, at that point, people were using um, inhaled steroids and had asthma action plans and everything like that. When I went to Alabama, I, like probably 80% of the people I saw down there were on theophylline. Um, um, and there were certainly lots of people that had like asthma slash COPD kind of crossover that were using that as a, as a principal drug. Um, and so probably some of the old time COPD people over at Truman may even be, may even um, still be on Theophylline. I don't know um, if you've seen any over there or not with the, with the adult asthma clinic. Um, they probably most have been taken off, but they, it was a very popular drug. <clears throat> the, um, we used to do aminophylline drips all the time in the hospital. We'd worry about side effects, but basically, as you were saying, if you kept the if you kept the um, um, the theophylline level between probably 15 and 18, you didn't really have to worry about the side effects. Pushing it much beyond 15 or 16 or so, um, you just got more side effects than benefits. So your 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 sweet spot was around having like a theophylline level about 15 or 16. Um, and I can't tell you the number of nights I stayed up, um, you know, giving mini boluses and adjusting the, the rates and stuff to get the levels where I wanted them to be. That used to be the, the bane of our existence as an intern in a, in a resident because um, everybody was on aminophilin drips. Um, the, um, when it be, when uh, theophylline kind of fell out of favor and people were using inhaled steroids, et cetera, and things like singular and stuff came in. Um, the um, 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 theophylline, um, um, the, we, I was part of a, um, a sort of like a practice parameter here for the hospital uh, for good practices um, years ago. And we looked at, we did all the research looking at theophylline and, and, and was there a role for theophylline being used in the hospital? 
And basically, <clears throat> um, there are studies, some older studies out there that show that if you use um, aminophilin, which basically is the uh, IV theophylline, but if you use aminophilin um, 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 in someone who is in status asthmaticus, you may be able to prevent them from being intubated. And so um, there were, uh, used to be, and there are fewer of them left around, but there used to be a number of, of physicians um, that trained in my uh, my decades or whatever, and um, that we used to see in the um, ICU if there was someone that was really bad and they were close to being, um, you know, they were worried about they were going to have to be put on a ventilator, they would put them on an aminophilin drip. And so that's probably what you saw. It was basically the, the theory behind that is that it may help prevent them from having to be intubated. Um, and there is some data on that. Um, yeah, so it's a few of the intensivists that still do it with every status asthmaticus patient that comes in. Yeah, and so they're probably they're probably my age or close to it <laughs> um, that would even that would know that. But um, but there is there is um, data out there. We we did dig through all that research and did <clears throat> um, um, when we put together that that parameter years ago. Um, but um, so there's a reason there's a reason that still could be used. <clears throat> um, so anyways, um, and um, there the there um, there had been some research probably in the last ten years with some newer phosphodiesterase inhibitors that um, that were that looked like they were going to be used for asthma. Um, but um, I guess from what you said, this there's Right now, there's there really hasn't been anything that's concrete that's come from that because um, um, uh, usually these things go in cycles and people will dig this stuff out again and start thinking about it and say, well, is there a use for it? And and you'll see these things come back again, sort of thing. So yeah, um, it's like they've tried they had tried to develop a number of them and then because of GI side effects, they didn't really go anywhere. But there's maybe one that is um, still undergoing some trials. Yeah, I think I think there's still people out there that are, that are looking for the magic pill that someone could take a pill once or twice a day and they wouldn't have to carry inhalers around with them and all that stuff, you know, sort of thing. So I think there's that holy grail that people are still looking for out there, and they're you know someone's you know every once in a while they dig it up again and think well we can you know find something else maybe. Um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> Yeah, someone has a comment there. It's my um, son out in the hallway. <laughs> and uh, um, um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, the uh, the Kremlin, and then you were trying to pronounce the name of that plant or whatever. Um, that's I believe that's wild carrot. Um, and um, really? um, and the because uh, there's a picture of it that I show in Jeopardy, one of the Jeopardies that I do that I show a picture of that plant and I give the name of it. I said, what's this, what is this plant used to make or something? And then the answer is chromalin. So um, just a little heads up if you see yeah, it. We better, we better get that Jeopardy question right now. <laughs> so you see this little, this little weed looking plant that comes up on the screen, you know what it is. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I don't have any more things to go down memory lane for, but um, that's uh um, but I, I, again, I, um, you did make me feel very old this morning. <laughs> well, no, thank you for your input. I appreciate it. It was, it was fun hearing all your experiences with those different drugs. Anybody else have any other uh, questions or comments? Because if not, I have one more slide here to say happy birthday to Dr. D, the king of the program directors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes. I wanted to say happy birthday and that we're grateful for you and appreciate all that you do for us. Okay, well, that's very nice of you. I, <laughs> oh, gosh, that's really sad. <laughs> happy birthday. Sean, that's awesome. Uh, yes, thank you very much, guys. Um, you all have a great weekend, okay? You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.